I received a couple of requests the other day to address Isaiah 30, 15, when the Lord says, in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength. So that's what I'm going to be addressing in this video. In order to understand what God is saying in this passage of scripture, we need to understand what he established. What is he referencing? And what he's referencing is that he made a name for himself. He proved himself to his people. He taught them who he is, what he requires, what they must do in order to be in him, what they must do in order to be saved. And so that's what we need to reference. That's what we need to go back and try to understand. What did God establish here? Because unfortunately, most of what we are focused on is what the world has established because in wickedness has increased to such a point that we think that we are surviving and being provided for and being healed by the work of our own hands or by the work of somebody else's hands rather than by the sovereignty of God's hands. And yet we say things like he's the creator and he's the one who formed the heavens and the earth and formed man from the dust and breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul. And we say that we believe all of these things and then we go out day after day working by our own hands, by our own ideas, strategizing in business, having separate ethics from you know, our so-called Christian ethics and then our world ethics, which is called double-mindedness. We can't rest. We identify ourselves by syndromes and diagnoses of anxiety and panic and fear because we've completely lost sight and understanding that God has called us into rest. He never called us to any of that stuff. In fact, he warned us not to get tripped up in the work of our hands. He even established certain things like Sabbath once a week, a Sabbath year, so that we would understand that God is the one who's sovereign, that he's the one who provides, that he's the one who blesses for obedience and punishes for disobedience. So I'm going to give a very rough history and timeline of what God established with his people. So, I mean, we've talked about this several times in other videos, but we're now we're talking about it from the perspective of what is God's heart? What does he require of us? Where are we getting this wrong? Because my friends, we are getting it so, so wrong. We have been getting it wrong for many generation upon generation to the point that we don't even know what's right anymore. In fact, what's right is so far from our comprehension and the ways that we've been living that we think that the things that he established, oh, that couldn't possibly mean what we think it means. He couldn't possibly have meant that. He's saying that metaphorically. He's saying that symbolically. There's no way that he actually expects us to take an entire year off of work. Or does he? There's no way that he truly expects us not to work for an entire day. I mean, how will the world keep spinning? There's no way that he actually requires us to fast. Many of us not even knowing what a fast is, right? We just think that we're withholding from our flesh and then we continue to live in our flesh and we wonder why he's not returning to us. Well, because we don't return to him in our flesh. In order to return to him, we have to circumcise from the sinful flesh, discipline the physical flesh, drop into our heart and spirit because God's spirit was placed in our heart and he is spirit. So he communicates with our spirit and our heart is where he's sanctifying us. That's where we receive his ministry. That's where we receive his sanctification and cleansing and we become holy as he is holy. I was having a conversation with someone today who was telling me about the Enneagram and how at their so-called Christian university, the Enneagram is being taught in their classes. And it's being taught in such a way, by the way, by a professor who started out as a pastor and then moved over to psychology. You know how many people I've met who've done that? Started in pastoral care and then moved over to psychology because God's word wasn't enough. That's where we're at today. That is truly pathetic. That is a pathetic church. And that is not a heart after God. That is a heart that denies God's power, that denies his word, that denies his spirit and has not received his ministry. That is wicked. How can you claim to know and claim to know him and claim to believe in his word and then go move over to a pagan discipline? Absolutely sickening. 
So what we were talking about today is how the Enneagram is being taught at this person's Christian university, so-called Christian university. And because people are so lazy and refuse to return to God's spirit and they do not love his truth, they reject knowledge, they've not had healing. And that's the reason why they think that they need to extend beyond the word. And so rather than pursuing God's heart, rather than returning to him, rather than praying to him and saying, you know, God, there's got to be something more than what I'm doing. Correct me, deal with me, give me understanding because your word should be enough. Rather than doing that, they extend outside of God's word. They go and pursue and seek pagans to tell them about God. And so what's happening in counterfeit Christianity is that people are using Enneagram and which is, by the way, it, it's some sort of test to tell you about personality. That's what psychology does. That's what psychology has been doing for a really long time. And now you're being identified. Your identity is wrapped up in whatever diagnosis pops up out of there. This is the way that it's being used because I've done these assessments. In fact, there are times that I still do these assessments, but I don't do them for the reason that I was taught and trained in the field of psychology. The reason I do them is to identify certain symptoms and issues that people are struggling with so that we can then take those issues and look at them from the lens of what God has said and from the lens of, all right, why are these things? We know that these things are happening. We're not calling them a diagnosis. We're not looking at them from the perspective that the world looks at them, but we see that these things are going on. Is this consistent with your experience? My experience is that people typically say, yes, that's what I'm experiencing. All right. Now we need to take a look at why this is happening from the perspective of what God has said, that we are handed over to a spirit when we choose that spirit through sin. So where is this happening? That's a very different way of using those evaluations. But in terms of Enneagram and other evaluations, right, because you can take a Cosmo test and that, you know, that was like the thing that we used to do when we were kids was take some magazine test and then that told us who we were. And then we go and look at our horoscope and that also tells us who we are. No accountability, just soothsaying and fortune telling and telling us what our identity is, even though God, our creator, who we claim has formed the heavens and the earth and us, is totally sovereign, totally in control of everything that's going on. He told us our identity. He told us our condition. He sent his son to demonstrate our condition by healing people, driving out spirits, and telling them to return to God and repent. No, but we want Enneagram. That's what we want. We want an Enneagram to tell us what our personality is and to reduce everything to personality, to also excuse us because other people need to accommodate to our personality type. And this is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So these are the things that we pursue. So let's take a look at what God established because we've gotten really far. So the perspective that we need to understand is what is he established and how are we looking at these things now? The Israelites were in bondage. He promised a deliverer. The devil even tried to create, I tried to establish a plan to eliminate that deliverer, but he was saved. He was put in a basket and he was found by Pharaoh's daughter who raised him as her own. God provided a way for him to be taken care of and to raise him for his purpose. That deliverer, of course, was Moses, a foreshadow of things to come, a foreshadow of Christ. We're supposed to understand that our deliverer, our ultimate deliverer and savior, Messiah in Christ, saves us from bondage. So God promises this deliverer, this deliverer goes back to Pharaoh several times and says, the Lord says, let my people go. He sends plagues. Pharaoh will not let the people go, even though sometimes he says he's going to, and then he reneges. God also said that he raised Pharaoh up for that purpose. It's written in the word that he's the one who hardened Pharaoh's heart. Each time that he promised that he was going to let God's people go, he hardened his heart again so that he didn't end up doing it because God was making a name for himself. He has predetermined those objects of his wrath and those objects of his mercy. And the reason he has predetermined those objects of his wrath is to demonstrate his glory to the objects of his mercy. It's not for the objects of his wrath. There's nothing for them. It is to demonstrate to the objects of his mercy, his glory. What does that mean? God wants us to know that what we have been given by him is not because of us. 
He wants us to know that because of his righteousness and his sovereign choice, we could have, by the skin of our teeth, ended up in either group. There is nothing that we did to deserve that. And even still, we must have a heart for him and care about attempting to at least try to deserve that by fulfilling our part in the covenant, by obedience and faith, by being activated in the authority that he has given us for the purpose for which he has set us apart before the creation of the earth. So God does this several times. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go so that they can worship me. Why? So that they can worship me. Pharaoh doesn't let him go. And God says to his people during Passover, the first Passover, raise a lamb. You're to care for it for 14 days. You're going to slaughter it. And then you're going to put the blood of that lamb over your doorway. You're going to close your house and rid, you'll, excuse me, close your doors, isolate yourself, go into your house, close your doors, rid your house of yeast representing sin, bake bread that does not have yeast, no leaven, eat that lamb with bitter herbs. And when you do these things, I'm going to see that blood and I'm going to know the destroying angel, when I send the destroying angel to pass over your house. In every other household that does not obey this, the firstborn is going to be killed. So our sovereign God was capable. <laughs> this is interesting. I just remember that I received a nasty message the other day saying that, I was, that I'm a false teacher because I don't believe in the rapture doctrine or the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. So I'm a sicko because I think that God is going to torture his people. No, here's what I believe. I believe in what God has established that God is capable of sending a plague or taking, killing every firstborn in every household of those who don't obey him. And that he is perfectly capable of passing over his people without removing them from the earth. That's what I believe because that's what he established. So when Paul teaches us that God's wrath is not for us, no, God's wrath is not for us. That's absolutely correct. God's wrath was not for the Israelites, was it? God's wrath came on the Egyptians. He's capable of sending all of those plagues and passing over his own people. He can do that. He's capable of sending COVID and passing over his own people. He's capable of sending a hurricane and passing over the people that he chooses to pass over. That was something that really stuck out to me. When I was, um, you know, observing some of the footage with Hurricane Ian, uh, I mean, it was incredible. You would look at the footage and you would see that the, everything had been leveled, but there'd be like everything flat and like one house standing. There was another, um, there was coverage of one guy who was either in, he was in an apartment or some sort of condo or something like that. So, I mean, this is like, you're sharing walls here and his condo or apartment was not even touched. Now, I'm not making a determination as to whether these are God's people or not. What I am seeing and being reminded of is that God is capable of passing over us. We need not rely on our own understanding. And we have to take the entire word together. I've already explained this in other videos, so I'm not going to get into it in this video, but rapture doc or the so-called rapture doctrine and pre-tribulation doctor doctrine is false. God will not come until the abomination of desolation has been set up. And at least 45 days after that, because the abomination of desolation is set up at the 1290th day. Blessed is the one who reaches the 1335th day. That's 45 days after the abomination of desolation is set up. So God does this. He passes over his people, those who obey him, those who love him, those who revere him, those who rid their houses of yeast, representing the sanctification process that happens through his ministry, through his Holy Spirit. Also, not in our flesh, in our heart, and our spirit, and by our, his spirit to our spirit. So he passes over his people. Pharaoh, you know, everybody's uh, in shock, grieving. Pharaoh tells Moses, get your people out of here. Go, go worship your God. Take, take your people, just get out of here. So Moses does exactly that. God turns the heart of the Egyptians so that the Israelites are able to plunder them before leaving. You know why? Because God's capable of doing that too. And so they come out of Egypt. 
They come out of that bondage. They take their livestock. They take their children. They take that bread and they leave. And Pharaoh has a change of heart. Why? Because God changed Pharaoh's heart. Because God is capable of conforming everything to do what he intends to do. He puts it in Pharaoh's heart to chase after them and try to enslave them again. And so Pharaoh comes after him. And what does he do? He parts the Red Sea, leads his people through the sea, and then closes up the sea on the enemies that are chasing them. Brings them into the wilderness, feeds them manna from heaven, quail, water from a rock, begins to teach them, these are the things that you need to do in order to obey me. I want you to observe a Sabbath. So six days, each day you're going to gather the manna. And then on the sixth day, you're going to gather manna for two days so that you will observe my Sabbath. You will observe this day of rest. And he says to Moses, when he's teaching them this, I'm going to test the people. I'm going to see if they have a heart for me. I'm going to see if they're going to obey what I say. Don't gather any more than you need for the day. And some of the people gathered more than they needed for the day. Why'd they do it? Well, why do we do it? Why do we gather more than we need for the day? Because we don't trust that God's going to take care of us the next day. We don't believe. We don't believe that he's going to provide for us. We don't believe that he fills up the pools of the earth, that he can do that without rain. We believe in the work of our hands. We believe in what we've been taught by the world. And we're scared because we lack faith, because of unbelief in our heart. But God was teaching his people, this is what I require of you. And there are consequences when you disobey me. And I will foil the work of your hands. Just as he says throughout the word, I'm going to cause you to work and toil because that's what you've trusted in. And I'm going to foil everything that you produce. There will be holes in your purses and the land will not bear its fruit. You will toil and the land will not bear its fruit because you've despised me and you have not trusted in what I've taught you. So some people went and collected more manna and by the next morning, when they were hoarding it to make it for the next day, he sent maggots and a strong stench. Because what did he tell him? Only take what you need for the day. I am the Lord your God. I'm going to provide this each day, and you have to trust that I will do that. How is that only relevant to Israelites? How is not that not relevant to us today? Because we have bank accounts, because we have science, because we have all of these things that we've done by the work of our hands, all of these false gospels, false knowledge, a lie that we've made our refuge. God says he'll foil all of it. And not only will he foil all of it, he will cause us to work. And then he won't even let us enjoy the fruit of our labor because we trusted in our own hands, because we trusted in ourselves, because we trusted in what he gave us, because we trusted in our own beauty, because we trusted in our own strength, because we went off and served other gods and worshiped them. So God continues to teach his people and he teaches them based on their development, based on the development of his church, based on the development of his people, of the development of his nation. He's teaching them these building blocks of what he requires, what's going to happen. He establishes his holy days, days and celebrations that we are to celebrate to him and that we are to remember so that we pursue his heart and so that we don't forget certain things that he has done and certain things that he's going to do. And this way, we're continuing to look forward to these holy days and we're constantly orienting our hearts to what does this mean? Tell us more. Give us more wisdom. Give us more understanding. What's important to you? He establishes his Sabbath, his Sabbath day. He establishes a Sabbath year. And then in Leviticus 26, he begins to talk with us about, he's already laid out, these are the things that I command of you. Now here's what you need to understand about the consequences of obedience and the consequences of disobedience. I will bless you for obedience and I will punish you for disobedience. And under blessing, he talks about the provision and the protection that will be given for obedience that we will live in the land that he has given us, that he, we will have peace, that our enemies will not be able to touch us, that we will even plunder our enemies, that the land will bear its fruit. So what's the opposite of that? Global warming, famine, pestilence, plague, 
just so happens, yeah, if you disobey me, if you are hostile towards me, if you despise me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. The land will not bear its fruit. You will go into captivity. I mean, these are these are the things that he has said throughout the Bible. You'll go into captivity. Your enemies will rule over you. There will be famine, plague, pestilence. And when I start doing these things, if my people who are called by my name will recognize that I'm the one doing it, will remember the promises that I've made to them and to their ancestors, what I have said, the name that I made for myself, the sovereignty that I hold over this earth and their lives and your, and your souls, and they will return to me, I will return to them, and I will heal their land, and I will heal them, and I will restore them. So not only did he say this, but he proved it because he did deliver his people from their enemies multiple times when they had disobeyed him and gone into captivity. Why did they go into captivity? Because of racial propaganda? No. Because of what God has said, that he will send them into captivity when they disobey. That's a spiritual thing. It's not a racial thing. It is a spiritual issue. If man makes it a race thing, who's man? Who cares about man? You need to know that it's a spiritual thing. You need to take God at his word that when these things happen, when anything happens in your life, it is under the sovereignty of God. You need to know that the people who he is using to execute those things, what spirit do they have? Is it because all white people are evil? Is it because all rich people are evil? Is it because all, I don't know, people from Egypt are evil? No, you need to understand the spiritual forces that are, that are operating here, that God hands you over to the spirit you've chosen. If that spirit is persecuting, oppressing, conquering, colonizing, murdering, forcing counterfeit Christianity, supposedly Christianizing, forcing that, really? Is that what God did? No, that's not what God does. It's not his pattern. You have to recognize who's in power and what is the spirit behind that? And also, why have you been handed over to that spirit? So I could go on about other things that God has established. But the bottom line is God has required that we obey. He has established a set of rules that we need to trust in him. And that when he says you need to rest for a day or a year, that's what we need to do. And if we're resting, we're going to hear him. We're going to be convicted. If we're fasting, we're going to be getting deeper into him. We're going to continue to return to fasting because we're going to experience the fruit of getting deeper into him. And he's going to convict us. And so if we are resting in him and trusting in him rather than out there so busy for the world and all of the things that the world commands, there's no way that we can continue to obey the things that God commands. We have to choose which one are we going to serve. And God requires us to repent and to rest. That's what he requires. He's healing us of the condition. We are being healed of a sinful condition, of a curse. And the way that we are healed through that is through receiving his covenant, through obedience, not through our justification of obedience and adding to that all of the things that we're doing in the world. Because we have the appearance of godliness, but we deny his power to be able to provide. We deny his power to be able to do what he has said he will do, protect us from our enemies, pass over us when he brings his wrath, provide for us without us having to go and return to pagan disciplines and fields that he has pulled us out of. Does he not say that? Those who have left fields for me and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Do we believe that? Because if we believe that, we have to put our faith where our mouth is. We have to live out this faith that we're claiming to have. And I've watched many people return to the vomit. And why is that? I know it from personal experience because I know how difficult it is to 
wrap my heart around what God has promised because everything I've learned in the world has been so contrary to that. Everything I've learned in the world is about the work of my hands, is about what the world tells me I need to do in order to survive, in order to be provided for, in order to be able to support myself when I retire one day. Do we have a limited God or do we have a sovereign God? Now let's take a look at Isaiah thirty fifteen again. In repentance and rest is your salvation. One of the first things that people tell me when they begin to heal, because healing is synonymous with salvation, one of the very first things that they tell me when they begin to heal is that God gives them sleep and he makes them sleepy and that they sleep like they haven't slept in years. One of the first things they tell me when they're being attacked and when they have a spirit of fear is I'm not getting any sleep and I'm on you know, pills to sleep at night. I have insomnia. Insomnia is nothing more than an inability to rest in God. And most often those who are restless and have so-called insomnia also have a spirit of fear because they've not been fanning into flame God's Holy Spirit through faith, through ministry, through rending their heart and resting in him, truly resting in him. They're far too consumed in their flesh in rumination and worry and fear about what it is that they need to do. They don't trust him. They don't believe or they're not being, they have not been living as one who believes. But if they return to him, he will cause them to believe. He will return to them and he will prove himself. But they have to get themselves to that point where they're able to rend their heart to him, truly return to him, not in their flesh, not by a fast of the world, Because, you know, a lot of times when I talk with people about fasting, they say, well, I'm already on a water fast. Well, I'm already doing this fast for, you know, my doctor has me doing blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's not a fast. That's the way the world fasts. And it's, and they fast that way in part in order to confuse God's people from what true fasting is. True fasting has to do with returning your heart to God, rending your heart to him. You need to circumcise from the sinful flesh, discipline your physical flesh, which is part of, that's all worldly fasting does is it attempts to discipline the flesh. But if you never get it back into the heart and spirit, you just keep returning to the flesh because that's where you're living. You keep returning to those sinful desires. You keep returning to that, those binging and indulgent behaviors. Because again, you're not resting in him. You're not trusting him. You're not returning to him. You're not receiving from him. You're living in your flesh. You're just simply withholding and biding your time. So why in repentance and rest is our salvation? Why is our salvation in repentance and rest? Because that's what you do when you trust him. That's what you do when you believe in him. You rest in him. You trust him. You work through those things that are in your heart that are causing you to fear and not be able to sit still and just trust in who he has said he is. When you begin to repent and understand the condition and the behaviors that you have been engaging in, the idolatry that you've been engaging in, including, uh, not only including, but especially the idol of self, when you begin repenting of that and you begin changing and being changed by him, you start to heal. You're demonstrating that you are working your heart into trusting him and resting in what he has said, what he has promised, what he has spoken, and those words that he says will never pass away. Your job, your career, your 401k, your IRA, your health, your strength, your beauty, all of those things are going to pass away, but his word will never pass away. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. Well, what does quietness and trust look like? I had a recent experience with this, so I will tell you what it looks like for me. Recently, I was telling you that I was having a really difficult time uh, with this provision 
aspect of what I'm doing because it's against everything I know to not be working. It's against everything I know to have two mortgages and all of the things that I have and not have any income. How does that add up? How is it possible that God's going to be able to take care of me? I believe that he can and will. But let me tell you, at a certain point, when you don't see it happening, it does get scary. And it doesn't mean that you give up or that I'm going to give up and that I'm going to go back to the things that I once did. That's not an option. In repentance and rest is my salvation. In quietness and trust is my strength. Quietness and trust. Sitting in my little chair with my Bible and my journal, calling out to God, Lord, please give me a heart after yours. Please give me the heart that I need to have in order to endure, in order to live the way that you have called me to live, in order to obey you because I know you have brought me here, but I cannot do this without you changing me. I cannot do this without you giving me a heart after yours. I'm not capable of that. Change my heart and I will continue to sit here and journal out what I need to journal and read your word and remind myself of your promises and remind you of your promises and hold you to your word and hold myself to the commands and responsibilities and authority that you have placed on me. I don't start freaking out. I don't start engaging in the work of my hands. I need to be still. I need to be quiet. I need to trust and I need to receive what he is doing in me. Does this mean I'm quiet like as in I'm not talking to him? No, it doesn't mean that. But it also doesn't mean that I'm in my flesh. That's what I believe God is talking about here with regard to quietness, that that we're not in our flesh going you know, crying out to him and being desperate and all these other things. We need to be in the heart and spirit because when we're in the heart and spirit, now we're rending our heart to him rather than in our flesh requiring him in desperation to do things in the way that we want him to do things, in the way that our flesh is planning and strategizing, in the way that our flesh is leaning on its own understanding. No, We do the work in our journal to get into the heart and spirit, to soothe and discipline, and then to get into the heart and spirit and to bring ourselves correctly to God. That's what I believe is meant by in quietness and trust. We have to do that work in order to continue to trust him, in order to get deeper in him and deeper in what he has called us to do and be. There's no way to do that if you don't know how to get into your heart and spirit. He will not listen to those who continually call out to him in their flesh. That's desperation. It's noisy. There's no trust there. It's requiring him to accommodate to us rather than us to conform to him. We're not still. We're not quiet. We're not trusting when we're in our flesh. And frankly, there is no way no way that I could do what I am doing right now with him where he has me in my life. There's no way that I could do this if I was living in my flesh. If I didn't know how to bring myself to him correctly, how to receive him correctly, how to examine my heart, my feelings you know, within the design that he has given me. If I didn't know how to do that, very work that I teach you how to do, There is no way that I could be this deep with him. I can't even see picking up the covenant that he has extended to me because I would just be in terror all the time. I would be so afraid all the time. It is essential that we learn to get out of our flesh, to discipline our physical flesh, and to get into the heart and spirit if we're going to receive from him. If we're going to receive his ministry and pick up this covenant, we cannot live in the flesh, period. There's absolutely no way to be disciplined in the flesh by the flesh. It makes no sense. If he tells us to be disciplined in our flesh, there's somewhere he's telling us to live. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Where does he want us to live? In our spirit, by his spirit, he is spirit. He communicates with our spirit. 
He cleans us up in our heart. And we know that because that's where we're going to be justified. Ask yourself these questions. Are you resting? Are you receiving his ministry and being cleaned up? Are you repenting? Are you examining? Are you acknowledging? What is rest? Rest does not mean that you're just simply able to get good sleep. That's the fruit of having rested in him. Resting means that you're taking him at his word. You're not trying to supplement or augment what he has already established with the work of your own hands, especially the very things that God has said not to do or has convicted you are not of him. What is quietness? What is trust? Quietness means that you don't have the racket of the flesh hijacking your ability to hear him, interfering in your ability to trust him, prohibiting you from resting in him because your flesh is disciplined. It's quiet. And it must be quiet in order for you to be led by his Holy Spirit. You cannot have that racket. You have to learn to get still in your heart and spirit by his spirit. In quietness and trust is your strength. And what does he say on the opposite end? If you pick up your flesh or if your flesh starts picking up control again and you start trying to control what's going to happen, for example, if I tried to go back to that career and I tried to, I don't know, market, get new accounts again, start another career. I don't, you know, if I, if whatever it is, I don't even think those things are options because I gave away my reputation. I gave away everything. There's not an option to go back to what I gave up. But if I tried, I would be demonstrating who I serve. There would be noise again in my flesh of all of the things that I need to do, 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 ways that I need to work, the ways I need to control. Where would be my trust? Where would be my quiet? Totally non-existent. There would be no stillness. There would be no quiet. There would be no trust. I could say that I trust him. I could say that with my lips, but we know where my heart would be. My heart would be trusting in the work of my own hands. In quietness and trust is your strength. In repentance and rest is your salvation. God wants us to know. How many times does he say in the word, I am the Lord, your God? Here are the things I command. Here are the things I've done. I am the Lord, your God. Here are the things I'm going to do. I am the Lord, your God. What does he want us to understand? He is the Lord, our God. He is the Lord, our creator. He is the Lord, our healer. He is the Lord, our provider, our protector, our husband, our father, our counselor, our judge, our attorney, our vindicator, our teacher, our rabbi. He is the Lord, our God. We have to be brought to a position where we understand that with our whole heart and we are living into that with our whole heart. That's our covenant. In repentance and rest is our salvation. In quietness and trust is our strength. So that when the Israelites didn't work for an entire year, this was their livelihood to work in that field. Interesting that we call our careers, our discipl the disciplines that we go into, that's our field. What field do you work in? Do you think that God is only able to produce fruit in the fields if the Israelites obeyed him? Do you think that he's only able to do that, but he's somehow limited in being able to provide for us because now we have money, because now we use currency instead of fruit and grain, livestock. Now we have currency. So, oh, well, sorry, you're out of luck. He's not able to provide that. He is the Lord, our God. He separates the light from the darkness. He spread out the heavens. He formed the earth. He formed man from the dust, blew breath into his nostrils, and he became a living soul but he's limited by our currency, by the things that man has established on earth, that man is lifted up as a God over him. At least we think that we established it. God established it. He established everything and he can erase whatever it is. And he does indeed conform all things for the good of those who love him, for the good of those who trust him, who repent, who rest, who trust 
who are quiet, who bring quietness to their soul, rest in their heart and spirit, in his spirit and in his sovereignty. They believe that he is the Lord. I hope this video has helped you to understand Isaiah 30, 15 a little bit better. As always, please feel free to write your comments and questions in the comments section. I love hearing from you. I love the interaction and the dialogue. And I thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video. I'm adding an addendum to this video because one of the things that I realized is that I didn't talk enough about your strength. Here's my personal experience with strength. My experience is that when I am struggling with faith or when I'm pushing to endure and do all I can to, to stand, because really I would say just because you're struggling to continue to stand doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have faith. I mean, as long as you're not returning to the vomit and you're continuing to press forward and to trust, you're living that faith. And that's what I'm continually doing. And that's what I'm continually talking with you about doing. So one of the things that I experienced last week is that God kept calling me to affirm myself, to continue to do all I can to stand, as the word says, to keep affirming by reminding myself, these are the things that God has done. This is what God has done in his word. This is what he's done in my life. This is what his word says. This is what he promises me. I shared about how I open my prayers now, reminding myself what it means to be in the name by thanking him and reminding myself what the name represents, the name that he has made for himself throughout scripture as well as in my life. So he's continually been, been uh, putting me in a position to where I need to do all I can to stand. I need to do all I can to endure. And let me tell you, the place that he's brought me is not a place in which I can, that I can white knuckle. I am past that. I am beyond being able to white knuckle in the flesh. He has brought me to a place in which I have to discipline my flesh. When my flesh starts to try to rise and, and freak me out and ruminate and strategize and all of the things that my flesh tries to do, I've got to get it disciplined. I've got to kill that sinful flesh, totally circumcised from it. And I've got to get into the heart and spirit. I have to trust and get quiet. So here's what I want to tell you about strength, because God is telling us that in quietness and trust is our strength. When we actually get ourselves there, when we actually do the work to discipline, circumcise, and get into the heart and spirit, when we finally do that and we do the work to affirm ourselves and remind ourselves and call on him and we finally get quiet, then he shows up. My experience is not that God shows up to do that work for me. He requires me to do the work and to demonstrate the choice that I'm making and my commitment to stand, my commitment to remind myself. And so it's not because God is required to somehow show up. It's because in his righteousness, he shows up and he rewards and blesses the work that I've done. That's why that's our strength. Because if we're willing to work ourselves into that posture, he will strengthen us. Now, I want to show you where this is in the Bible because this is absolutely biblical. It is my personal experience, my personal testimony, but my personal testimony should also align with scripture, shouldn't it? When Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was experiencing a lot of temptation. We're told that he's been tempted in every way that we've been tempted. So he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He was being tempted in the flesh. But he did the work, didn't he? So Satan showed up and said, you can have all this. You can have all this. All you have to do is pay homage to me. If you're really the son of God, turn these stones into bread. He gave it his best try to tempt Jesus. And Jesus was indeed experiencing that temptation. I think that sometimes we look at, at him and think that he didn't experience it the way he, we do. Uh, he came here in the flesh he absolutely experienced that. He just didn't sin, but that required a lot of him. And what did he do when he was being tempted? He continued to stand. He continued to endure. And 
he continued to speak on the word of God, reminding himself and declaring it, no, this is the word of God. This is the truth. And finally, the devil fled and an angel came and attended him. Is that the strength? God requires us to do our work. He even required it of his own son. He was in the garden of Gethsemane and Jesus was crying out to God and he was saying, if it's if if there's any possible way, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And he cried and he said, I am grieved even to the point of death. That's how much he was suffering. And yet he was working his heart into that. Lord, Father, I am willing to do whatever it takes. If at all possible, please let this pass from me. But here's the working of his heart. But not my will, but yours be done. Working his heart into that in quietness and trust, disciplining the flesh, disciplining his own desires in order to get into the heart and say, you know what? Here's the heart of my heart. I want to be in the name. My spirit is willing. My flesh is weak. I choose my spirit. I choose your will. That's where I'm going to live because that's the only place that I can live and fulfill your will. When we're living in the flesh, we're not capable of doing that. What we do is we keep asking him for what we want in our flesh. Jesus worked him, his heart into the proper position. He endured. He stood doing all he could to stand. And an angel came and attended him and strengthened him. That's your strength. That is your strength. In quietness and trust, you can only get quiet and trust in the place that you're willing. Your flesh is never going to be willing because your flesh fights against God. It has to be disciplined according to the place that's willing. I hope that helps to understand. When you do all you can to stand, when you remind yourself of God's word, when you remind him and hold him to his word, you hold yourself to his word and his commands, he is going to show up and he is going to strengthen you. That is my testimony and that is absolutely substantiated by the word of God. God bless you.